So today's talk, again, it's going to be my story telling you how I've done it. I've been in the industry since 1985, and my story isn't necessarily your story. It's just basically, hopefully, it's a, it's a formula that you may pick other, other diversified uh, offerings than what I'm going to talk about today, but it's going to tell you, hopefully, uh, it's to get you to think out of the box, to inspire you, to not be afraid to change, and, and to make your business sustainable through the unexpected world changes. In the beginning, you want to build knowledge. You can't just uh, all of a sudden say, mm, I'm going to be a cabinetry dealer and open up a cabinetry dealer shop and think you're going to survive because you probably won't make it past six months. So I started out actually um, in radio sales and a friend of mine had a high-end kitchen back showroom and she said I'd love for you to come and do sales for me. So I went there and I, uh, I always knew that I was a creative person. I lived in Miami, was a little girl driving in the car with my parents. I'd look at buildings that were decrepit and I think how can I make them better? So I didn't really know that that could even be a career until this moment. And you know I see this drafting board and I see what she does and I started working on multi-million dollar homes and learning the trade um, with the kitchens and baths. And I thought, wow, you know, how cool is this? Probably, I'm from Vera Beach, Florida, and we have a development there called Johns Island where most of our projects came from. You have names such as DuPont, Manoogian, uh, Corningware, so big homes. So I started in the high-end kitchen and bath business starting out doing sales, but I wanted to learn more, right? So I learned how to design, and I sought out courses just like you all are doing today to gain my knowledge, which is super important in anything you apply to your business. So I worked there for seven years. I thought it was, it was amazing when I, when I would work on these homes, kitchen, you know, six months down the road, they're moving into this gorgeous home, and I, I was a part of that. So to me, I was sold, this, is, this was my path, I had found my path. Um, I developed seven years of experience. People started asking for me. So then I knew it was ready, I was ready, I was ready to open my own showroom, which I did in 1992. Um, and I opened it over on the beach where my clients lived. I took that, that step. But then I felt that what I needed to do next to show that my clients is to become a professional. And back in that time, 1992, we had the CKD and the CBD. We didn't have the CMKD. So I wanted to sit for my certified uh, kitchen designer license. So I studied for it and, and I passed it and became a certified kitchen designer, then certified bath designer. Also at that time, ASID, there was a lot of lobbying going on. There have been people work, lobbying going on to say that you had to be a professional interior designer to be able to use interior designer in your advertising, right? So they had to do a grandfathering in for people that had businesses that were claiming that they were designers. They had to sit for what was called the NCIDQ, the National Council of Interior Design Qualifications. So they gave everybody a one-year grandfathering in. You know, I thought, why not? I'm going to go for it, right? I want to take myself out of the box. I don't want to be tied to any one thing. Right now, I'm a kitchen and bath designer. I'm working in kitchen and bath. So if I can pass this test, this two-day exam, then I can become a licensed interior designer, which opens up many things for me right? It takes me out of the box. It gives me the ability to do the whole house. So why limit yourself? So that's what I did. I sat for the NCIDQ. Now I was a licensed interior designer and continued those studies for many years. Um, and even just now in 2020, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of the NKBA people are like, Patty, why don't you get your CMKBD? And I, I was kind of defiant. It's like, really you guys keep making up these things and I got to keep but you know what I did it I filled out the paperwork and in 2020 I became a certified master kitchen and bath designer okay so now I have all the qualifications so at this point I've taken myself out of just doing kitchens and baths doing whole house doing commercial design and I have my own design uh, firm 
and it was Patricia Davis Brown um, fine cabinetry, right? So again, I kind of, when I started my company, Patricia Davis Brown, I didn't know what to name it. I went to a PR firm and I was coming up with things like designs by Patricia Louise and they're like, what's your full name? They said, Patricia Davis Brown. That's it, PDB, Patricia Davis Brown. And I'm like, well, that sounds like a law firm. They said, exactly, because they're going to take you seriously. So that's what I did at first, which I was building my brand. I was all of 29, right? I'm building a brand. At that time, that's what I needed. So now I am a professional. So why certification matters? You know, it, it, we have this little thing here. If you're having a heart problem, do you want to go to a general practitioner? No, you want to go to a cardiologist. If you, are, if you want a new kitchen or a remodel, you, are you going to have a builder do that? Wouldn't you rather have a certified kitchen designer doing it? So even in a competitive world that we're in, you know, you're probably going to get that contract over the one that's just a cabinetry dealer. So I believe wholeheartedly in this, and I know some of you are saying, oh, that doesn't matter, but I'm going to show you why it does. It gives your client confidence that they're hiring a professional, and nobody can take that from you. So it is worth the sweat equity to do that. The other thing it does, which is very important, which obviously everybody's in here to learn, um, it forces you to continue your, your education and expand your knowledge through CEUs, which if you stop learning, if you think, oh, you know, I do the best cabinetry and kitchens and baths and you, you know, you don't have a professional license, then maybe you're not going to be forced to do that. If you have your professional CKD, CBD, and CIDQ, whatever, you got to have 20 hours every two years. So you're going to learn. And why not pick things that you're going to be able to apply to your business for another revenue stream, right? So you can also market yourself as a professional. A lot of people in this industry cannot. So that, again, gives you a competitive edge. Um, becoming a professional interior designer allowed me to offer whole house and commercial design. Again, I have no boundaries now at this point because I took advantage of the grandfathering in clause and I studied and I, through the STEP program and I was able to do that. And now the whole world has opened up for me. I can consult on a major commercial project I can do lots of things. I'm not in a box. So, photographing your work. This is so important, and I learned this early on, long before there was an internet. Um, never even knew there, there would be an internet when I started doing this. Maybe it was my ego, I don't know. But uh, your portfolio proves that you do what you do. You, you, you don't just say, oh, I do kitchen the bass. I can show you, but you have to keep it fresh. So I recommend that even when you're doing, when you're writing a contract, that you put that in the contract that you're able, when the job is completed, to be able to come in and photograph your work. Super important, because as soon as the people move in and start living there, it's no longer your project. It's not going to look the same. So, but it's very valuable to capture that, to keep your portfolio fresh. It allows you to enter your work in design competitions. Oh my gosh, this is so important. So, and you want to, especially starting out, you want to enter your projects in every category you can enter them in. So I've been a judge in many, in many competitions. I've won 16 national awards and several state awards, and even to this day, if I'm not judging a competition, I'm going to put my work in it if I've got something that's worthy. Right, but you only need to win one national award to claim to be a national award winning designer, correct? So why not do the effort? But if you don't photograph your work, you can't do that, okay? And you know, even with our little cameras that we have today, you can do some pretty good work, but I highly recommend that you do professional photo shoots on all of your work and on the tiniest of details. I don't care if it's a pot rack you made. You know, you can use that. But the competitions is super important because, you know, we, it is all about marketing who you are, right? If you can't talk about it, if you can't say, if you can say, I'm a national award winning designer, people want to listen to you. That's why you guys are here today, right? You're not just 
listening to somebody that hasn't been in the industry 37 years and done the things that I've done. So if you don't, you've lost that opportunity and you don't want to do that. As it says, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is here, here's it, did it even fall? Because very quickly, the work that you've done goes out of style, very quickly. It's off trend and if you're showing an old portfolio, it's not a good look to the possibility of bringing in new clients, correct? So now we're going to talk about where I started making more money and learning about revenue streams. Adding lighting design to my business offering. I opened my showroom, my own showroom, Patricia Davis Brown Fine Cabinetry in 1992. I did this beautiful kitchen in Johns Island that I, that I just mentioned and it had a double island. It had mullion glass doors all the way down to the countertop. It had a tumbled marble backsplash. I realized when I was trying to do a professional photo shoot, it, we couldn't make it look good. And, and that was way before we could do any digital, you know, fix, fixes with it, right? We couldn't, I mean, it was 35 millimeter. And so what happened was, first of all, I'm, I'm looking and, and we had a main sink and we had a prep island and I just thought, at night, without natural light, how are these people even going to really be able to function well in this kitchen? And maybe they didn't, but their chef would have a hard time, right? The mullion glass doored cabinets came out gray in the photography. The mosaic backsplash, they had put in fluorescent fixtures. And you know, that's not okay but it was like a 4,000 K. So what it did to my tumbled marble is it turned it green. It changed the color of it. And there were puddles of light, horrible. But you know what I did with that terrible photographed kitchen that was actually really beautiful is later on in my talks about lighting design, I would hold up that picture and then I would hold up another picture that, was, that I had done the lighting on. And I would ask the lay people, because you know, sometimes we were doing how to survive a remodel project, so there were lay people in there, and they would always pick the one that was professionally lit, right? Um, because it's easy to see. Another thing that I realized is my clients needed me to know this, because the architects were not providing it. And I'm not picking on architects. You know, they do a lighting plan, but I test anybody in here to find an architectural lighting plan that is a true lighting plan and I'm going to show you how to do that. So I started seeking out lighting courses for my CEUs to learn lighting. And for 10 years, that's the only thing I took because I wanted to learn how to truly light a space correctly. I went to GE, I went to Cooper Lighting, I took the fundamentals of lighting, I took courses by ASID, but the best course I took was, was at KBiz through the NKBA. It was Lighting Made Easy by Michael DeLuca. And his book, which don't I ladies, I have like three of them because I sent, I sent my staff to his class. I took his course twice myself. I was having lunch with him after that course and, and I asked him a question. He goes, you really read my book? And I'm like, yes I did. Because what this guy did that was so clever is he got together with a, an electrical engineer and he developed the formulas to make it easy, right? Because none of us in here are electrical engineers, but by his formulas, by learning how to figure out beam spreads and how they go across an island to reduce shadows and to light a cabinet vertically that's a mullion door or a glass cabinets shining across each shelf evenly, when you talk to a client, that's easy to understand. And we've all lived in spaces where lighting is poor. So once again, by me gaining this knowledge, not only did I make my jobs better, but it closed my contracts. And then I was also able to add it as an extra charge or service. And in many times to this day, I am still hired just to do lighting design, which is, I charge by the square footage, do the calculations on a whole house. That makes very good money and it's no product. It's all up here, right? So I applied lighting design to my business offerings and charged for the service. I charge for all my services, right? Don't ever forget to charge 
Because if you don't charge and you're giving out free advice, they lose respect for you, right? You are the professional because you've developed the knowledge, you've become the professional, you have the knowledge that they need and people will pay for that. So never give it away free. So we get this architectural plan and first off, this was a model home and it was a $2.5 million home on the river. So I developed a two island design, but let's talk about the lighting plan. So here's what the architect made. First of all, they've got these recessed cans back here and then all clustered just in the middle of this room and there's nothing back here. Three lights along here. What makes a beautiful lighting plan a good lighting plan is a balanced lighting plan. Uh, the light is there, but you don't see it unless it's decorative, right? So there's a lot of problems with this to begin with. But if we look at the symbol here, which is his recessed can, A, interior downlight, manufacturer, catalog number, recessed, 120 volts, volts, which means nothing. Um, well, the vol volts do, the watts do, I mean, and then quantity 42. What is missing there? is the lamp. So the lamp that goes into that recess can has a beam spread. So who's left to pick that? The electrician. It's left to nobody, right? So I learned that very early on. Well, this is stupid because you have no idea what, you're, what the end result is going to be. And most of the time, they just put the same lamp everywhere and that's just wrong, okay? And I'm gonna show you why. This is the kitchen we developed. Obviously, we filled our space with a double island. The middle island had the big chef sink on it. This was the social gathering hub, kind of beverage bar area. This over here was all Sub-Zero Wolf aligned with the black glass. All tall units, which is the reason we have wall washers. We didn't want to throw puddles alike. We did the same, over, we had two columns here, and then this was our hood and book match marble. And then there's our general, somehow, wall washer, some do not. So we have a layered lighting plan here. We have general lighting, we have task lighting, we have decorative lighting, we have a legend. And then if I had wall cabinets, which I did not, there would be under cabinet lighting. If I had glass cabinets, there would be interior cabinet lighting and it would be running vertically, not a puck light at the top and glass shelves where each section got darker. So this is a true legend. We have the symbol, which is the recess can, five inch can. It's located in the kitchen pathways. It's a general, not a task. Fixture to be selected because I don't want to step on anyone's toes. I don't want to step on the, on, the, on the builder's toes. I can work with, mostly I can work with the fixture that he's specifying sometimes. The candle power matters, which is also lumens now in our world of LED. I still think in candle power because Michael DeLuca taught me how to do that formula, but because of our internet now, you can take a candle powder, power, which is the, how much light hits the surface, and you can put it in a calculator and change it to lumens, so you're still in control. Over here, I've got a PAR 30 LED 27K. If I don't say I want a 27K, they're going to put a 3,000, a 4,000, and they're going to gray out every finish of that room that our clients paid a lot of money for, or in this case, a model home that's going to show my work. And then the quantity. That, my dear, is an electrical legend. So any blueprint probably that you have sitting in your space right now, I promise you they do, they do not have that type of detail. So I have proven, I think to you all, that I can light a a, a space. And I go further by saying that I am not an electrical engineer, but what I do is I have studied lighting for 10 years, I applied it, I've become an expert on it, <coughs> and I aesthetically light the space. I give, as you can see, with the dimensions, the center line of each can. If I move that can, it changes my lighting plan, and that light's going to hit the space in the wrong 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 way which is not what we want right so yes yeah, so now i can pay for this and also a client thinks well if i don't hire you who's going to do this i don't know right so that gives me an advantage to winning that contract 
or them thinking that they need me, which I think they do. From this, just last week, I get an email in from, um, does anyone know Schneider Electric? A multinational um, electric company that does grids, that does automation, they're out of France, but they're all over the world. Multi-billion dollar company. They reached out to me. <laughs> Crazy, this is what you can do. They reached out to me to speak at their summit on a 30 minute talk about what designers need in lighting, where the trends are going. I'm giving that talk to their electrical engineers and product designers and salespeople, right? So this is what every one of you in here can do to add offerings that make you the expert that can keep growing and keep growing, whether it's consultation or whether it's working with a team to get a project done correctly. This is a properly lit island. So over an island, I use MR16 LEDs, right? Because it's a tight beam spread. We need more candle power there. That's where you're performing. And you can, if you see, I'm crisscrossing six inches above the counter. That means almost the Theatrically, I can light that island, right? Just like, because I'm in control of it. The client would be con in control on it. This is mathematical. I'm hired from people all over the world. I've never walked into the project because it's all mathematical. How cool is that, right? I can work for my home office and develop this and be paid for it. And then they get what they're paying for. 1992, I had opened Patricia Davis Brown Fine Cabinetry. And things were booming in Florida. We were coming up on 2005. We were at the bubble and things were crazy. So I doubled the size of my showroom. I thought that was a good idea. I took a big downtown office, seven plate glass windows. I could show my automation or my, you know, I was fully automated. I could show all my lighting design, I had a little lighting lab. I had, you know, my cabinetry, I had a big boardroom. And I had, a, I had a brick and mortar full of employees. But I no longer liked my life. I was managing people. And either I couldn't find good employees or I just sucked at that. That's not what I should have been doing. The recession was my best friend for a lot of reasons. It was the end of the world as we knew it. When I started out in 1985, I was always told that the high-end industry would never be touched. That people with money always had money and they would always spend the money. We did come into periods of time like in the early 90s when a you know, little bit, not, not a recession like this. Uh, the high-end market all of a sudden was impacted, right? The recession was teaching me, plus, you know, I, I wasn't really happy with my big brick and mortar. I found out that I'm not making any more money, I'm paying a bigger overhead, right? And I'm working harder because I can't get the employees to work, right? So the recession, I wasn't too, you know, everybody was in the same boat, right? But we had to figure it out. How it rolled out in Florida, and I don't know if any of you ever saw the movie, The Big Short, right? It tells the story, right? So in 2007, I heard it was coming. I heard there was a recession coming. Somehow, you know, I, I decided I better get ready for this. So all the slackers that were working for me, gone, right? Bye. I kept, because I was still drawing, hand drawing on my, on, on my board, I had an AutoCAD department. Yeah, I'm an old girl, you know? It's like, I do this really quickly here, put it on AutoCAD, right? I did not want to give up my board. But now, for the first time in my life, I actually had, had time. I had time to learn again, right? I wasn't just busy, you know, working on projects. So I kept one AutoCAD person and one uh, estimator. And, and 2008, I had noticed, I took note that people, that we had a lot of 
tire kickers coming in thinking everybody was running into trouble so you're going to work for me for free. I'm like, no, I'd rather drink a martini poolside than to design for you for free. So you're going to pay me to do this design. I took in $20,000 that summer on design fees that never took off because the world collapsed, right? But 2008, I told you about John's Island. We call it St. John's Island. <laughs> Uh, 2008, I saw a change. It wasn't homeowners coming in, it was investors seeking opportunities, meaning people buying up the old properties of Johns Island, looking for a place to put their money. So they were taking the old properties that were built in the 70s, they were gutting them. So because I'm a cabinetry dealer and a kitchen and bath designer, but more importantly, importantly a cabinet dealer, nobody was asking for design at that point. They wanted to buy cabinetry and they wanted to flip these homes. So my hat of cabinetry dealer went on because I'm all these things, I could shift and move and dance with our world as it was changing. And all of a sudden I was order taking. Ego aside, no longer a designer, I'm selling cabinetry. And I hit a record number year in 2008. Couldn't explain it, where did the recession go? Watch the big short and you'll find out we were all being lied to. So when the bubble burst, I had a lot of money. I had, now I'm down to one employee because I no longer needed the estimator because the world had stopped. It was like someone had turned the faucet off. No pipeline, right? We all know that. That pipeline dries up. You're done for. But everybody was. So 2009 was the day of reckoning that I realized that Ah, exit strategy, I hate this brick and mortar, right? There was a bit of calmness about me. Banks were failing. My husband was a banker. <laughs> he had to take a job with FDIC and move to Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, I closed the big showroom. As I said, I kept one employee, AutoCAD. I didn't know AutoCAD. So I said, you gotta teach me AutoCAD. She did not wanna teach me AutoCAD, but I was paying her. And I learned it fast because I knew how to draw. I knew engineering of cabinetry and layering and drawing ceiling plans and everything else. So picking up the AutoCAD really wasn't that tough. I thought it was gonna be, I was like, oh my gosh. So I learned it. Then I also said to her, you know, and this was before I, we actually, we actually closed the showroom either at the end of 2009 or 2010. So we're in this big empty building. And um, <clears throat> I said, you know, we're at ground zero. The bubble has burst and we're in Florida. Much like California, we, we're at ground zero. So if we're going to work, we've got to create a way to work. We've got to take our services and who we are outside the borders of Florida, right? In the internet, which I knew nothing about, I promise you, it scared me. I had enough people that worked for me, I didn't have to pay any attention to that. Now I do. Right Now it's time for me to learn. It's time for me to gain more knowledge to change with our world. So I said, why not start professionalkitchenandbathplans.com? Let's sell plans all over the world. Sounded like a good idea to me. So I started that.com. And they were like, yeah, why don't we open pdbhomestore.com and sell product too? Yeah, why not? Sounds easy, right? That was, I was pretty naive. And then the SEO people that were building our sites, they said, well, you need a blog. And I'm like, what's a blog? They're like, well, you, you gotta write about what you know, you know? I said, well, how often? And they're like, well, like every other week or whatever, and I'm like, okay. So you might wanna notice that those names up there are not Patricia Davis Brown. Because when I told you I hated my life with the big brick and mortar, I kept recreating that monster over and over and over again because Patricia Davis Brown was out there on that building. How can I sell, sell this building with my name without selling me with it, right? So I made sure that P, PKBP was professionalkitchenbathplans.com, not, has nothing to do with me, PDB Home Store, so my name's not on there. Digthisdesign.net and .com, I was a yogi at the time, learning to be in the present starting to love my life again. I said, oh, that's perfect. That's what I want for my name. None of which had my name on it. I wanted an exit strategy. If anybody picked up that phone and said, I want to buy one of these companies, I'm selling it to them. 
I, had it, I, could, I could exit out at any time that I wanted to, right? So I closed that brick and mortar. Never did I look back. I began to hire the younger generations. You know, there was a lot of talk about, oh, millennials and entitlement and everything else. Well, you understand that I had been in business since 1992 and couldn't find a good employee, right? And they were either my age or somewhere close to that. So I got to the point that I, well, let me just say this. Closed the big showroom, 2010, opened up a home office, closed the biggest job of my life by somebody building a 20, well, a 20,000 square foot spec home on the ocean. So I was back in business, let me just say that. Catch up. I could do this all by myself if I wanted to, you know. So anyways, I had a, a young design student call me and say, I will work for you for free. Her name is Stephanie Davis and she's sitting right there. It was nine years ago. And uh, that intrigued me. Well, maybe I'll talk to you. And she came in. I looked at her and I thought, hmm, okay. All right, we'll, we'll give this a go. She's pretty cool. And uh, you know, I learned as much from her as she did from me. Why? Because I had three internet companies now and I did not know the language. Okay, and she wanted to learn from me and I wanted to learn from her. And I have found, now I have two Gen Zers, incredibly brilliant, and they want to work. So I don't know where the, this reputation comes from, but this is the first bunch that I have ever, that truly wanted to work, and they do. They work independently. I don't have to micromanage, because I hate managing people, right? They want to learn, they want to create a career, and that's what they do for me. So becoming an influencer, well, that was a new terminology I didn't know about, but guess what? I guess I was an influencer, and this is how I found out. So Stephanie and I were trying to figure out this whole internet thing, and we were working hard on all three of the internet companies, and we were doing design jobs. Business had picked back up. I'm working from my home office. I'm working in Palm Beach. I'm working in Vero Beach, you know, and it was tougher after the recession. People were different. Right, so design was tougher. So, and we had the internet co companies going because I'm diversifying, right? I don't want all my eggs in one basket. That's one thing that the recession taught me. To be sustainable, you need to be diversified. So I was trying to keep all that going. Well, I received my first invite from a brand due to the one that really wasn't the business did this design, which was an aha moment. The blog was the business. So I get a phone call from a PR company out of Chicago, and they say, uh, Patricia, uh, have you ever heard of Delta Faucets? And I said, yeah, I would never expect that. <laughs> because I, back in the 80s, in one of my own homes, had a Delta Faucet that leaked all the time, you know, and I was just, I don't know what I meant. They said, well, we're starting a luxury brand called Brizo, and we want to introduce you to it and we want to fly you to New York City, to New York Fashion Week. We've aligned ourselves with Jason Wu, the fashion designer who designed Michelle Obama's dress for the inauguration. And we want you to attend the fashion show and to go to the after party and meet him. Wow, aha moment. I'm thinking, what? Yes, we're gonna do this with you and a total of 20 architects and interior designers. I almost fell over. I'm like, oh my gosh. So I started focusing in on digthisdesign.net. I'm like, wow, this is really the business. The other two aren't doing much of anything. You know, Amazon was, you know, I finally knew what Amazon was, one King's Lane, all the venture capitalist companies. I couldn't compete with PDB Home Store. I think uh, professionalkitchenandbathplans.com back then was too early. Uh, because it's really these young people that understand that you can work virtually. Patricia, good yeah. morning. So the dig this design is uh, your uh, medium for the blog, right? It is a blog. So how many blogs were you doing at the time when you got that talk off? Well, here's what happened. Good question. Okay, so here's what happened. So I was, you know, I started out and I was doing maybe one a week. 
And then I started getting busy again in design, right? And that's what was bringing in the big money. I'm just trying this, these internet things to get them going. So I ended up, there was a company called Hanaway and Associates out of Detroit. They're no longer in business, but you know, I kind of looked at her formula and how, and I thought, I need you to do this for me, right? And she didn't do it well, but some things that she did do, like she saw Pinterest and she says, Pinterest is big. To this day, I don't know Pinterest, but one thing I do know, it's 95% of my acquisitions on social media, and I do not even myself do it, right? So she, she had that knowledge, and she built our Pinterest, which now I have that managed, right? But anyways, so she was managing it. Not well, you know, putting out these posts. I would do product reviews and things like that. So I kind of pulled back just because I had design jobs, right? And I was letting her do it. And Stephanie and I were still doing some things. But then I got my next invite, which was Hubbard and Forge and Adorn had a collaboration going and they wanted bloggers and they invited four of us to come out, fly us out to New York City to do the press and to talk about their collaboration between their decorative you know, lighting with their switch plates that match the hammered metals and, and, and the things like that. So while I was there, again, everything I'm learning, I really, you know, I'm faking it. You know, I just, yes, I have a blog and it seems to be getting some attention. So, okay. So I'm out there. And again, at each one of these events, you, you know, you meet more people and you learn more. There was one blogger and she wanted to be a designer, but she lived in a small town in Illinois, right? So all she could do is remodel her own home. And it was a beautiful blog, but it was about her remodeling. It's like Stephanie and I kind of laugh because she had this hand, like statue, that was almost like in every one of her pictures, but she, it was a beautiful blog, but it was like she just moved it around and talked about her home and she was very appealing. So she started giving us tips about, you gotta get on Instagram. And I'm like, oh my God, not another social media. I, I mean, you know, Twitter, I didn't like any of that, but I knew I had to do it. We're in a new world and I'm learning. But she, she tells us, guys, you gotta be on Instagram because Instagram's gonna bring people to you and it's gonna bring your analytics up and make your blog more valuable. And I'm thinking, valuable? You know, I'm sitting there, wow because I'm paying somebody. So I, I come back home and I tell Stephanie, you know, these, these design clients are kind of annoying. Why don't we take a little sabbatical and learn this blog sphere? I said, because this girl, when she told me what she was making, it's what I was paying this girl to manage. And you know, and I've got, I've got her, right? She's brilliant and she knows the language. She knows production. She knows how to do video. And we kind of learned the blog together and we just threw everything at it. Now we were focused. We did clean drink happy hour because they said video. So we had a YouTube channel. We just crazy. We just threw everything at it. We had fun doing it also. So we, we took our blog back and got rid of Hanaway and Associates. Every, every time I turned around, there, there was another opportunity with the blog Again, our world was changing, and not only did, you, did I need to be a designer, but I also needed to be a marketer, right? And the blog was part of that, and uh, social media was part of that, which I was still learning that. So then, I tell my husband, who, you know, I've always made money in design, because I, it's, I do, it's great money. And, but I was, I was, it was getting old and, and I just, I said, I need, to I need to step back. I don't know, I had some crazy clients. I don't know if I wanna do this anymore, scaring him half to death. He was like, what are you talking about? I said, you know what? I said, I can't tell you, but my gut tells me I have to go in this direction. And I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to do it. And I did. So I took about two months off. I really didn't mean I wouldn't come back to design. I just scared him a little bit. But then, two months later, I did have a little bit of anxiety in those two months. And uh, then I get a call from the NKBA. And I was one of the first KMB insiders. I don't know if you all know who or what that is, but they had put six people together, influencers. So there was, you know, HGTV stars, two of them. There was um, 
two designers out of New York, there was a, a big blogger out of Texas, and there was me, the influencer. You know, like I said, I didn't know, what, what's an influencer? I guess I'm an influencer, right? Another diversification of my company, right? It keeps evolving. So they call me up and they're like, um, we'd like to hire you and we're gonna pay you this to fly you around the world to speak on stages at shows in Milan, Spain, all the AD, ICFF, with these really cool people that we've all become very good friends. And every one of these events too is networking. Is like, there, I can't go hardly anywhere and not know other influencers. Let's just call them movers and shakers, right? I mean, basically, if you just stay in one place, you're never gonna be that mover and shaker, right? So this is what I'm showing you that I did. So now I'm a k and insider for a year and I travel the world with these really cool people talking about what I love, design. So then after that, I was invited to serve on the national board. It was a great honor for me. And I served a two year term with really major, you know, CEOs of companies and was a part of this, you know, wow, the world, the doors just keep opening and opening. And the reason that they do is what I've been talking about, gaining the knowledge, not being afraid to step out of that box and expand and expand and expand. And sometimes it's just a surprise. Like what's an influencer? Me, I'm an influencer, right? So then I served on, uh, I, get, I get a call from um, Decor. They, somebody there you know, knew me, they said, we gotta talk to this influencer. And uh, they paid me to talk to me um, on a phone call. They were gonna fly me out, but I couldn't, I couldn't go out. But, so they, they, they did it on a phone call. Uh, Decor had just been purchased by Samsung, and because I'm so old, and I've been in this industry since 1985, five, I know Decor and when they began, and it, it was a, you know American family out of California, and I actually served on the board with Stephen Joseph, the son of Decor. But anyways, they called me and they wanted to pick my brain. Then they called me back and they said, look, we want you to be part of our advisory board. And it, I forget how many of us there were, but they were from all over, from Canada. There were architects, there were designers out of California. And so here I am again, back with these really, you know, another bunch of cool people. And, and, and for this, we're gonna give you one of our suites. Well, I had a Sub-Zero Wolf in my, in my house. So I was like, where am I gonna put this? you know, another luxury brand appliance, but they want to give that to me. And they're flying me to Korea, to Samsung, where we go walking into Samsung and there's this, there's this screen that's spread across the whole huge place with all our faces up there. I mean, I'm talking, guys, sky's the limits, right? We're the influencers, they were there to greet us and they wined and dined us and showed us Korea and it was, it's, it's just amazing, you know? So it just kept happening. And even today, selected as one of the voices for the industry, speaking to you today is a, is a great honor. Um, so every day I open my email because of the things that I have done to not be afraid to make the changes or to think even that I can do it. I'm here today speaking to you and all these things that have happened to me are the, are the steps that I've taken to make, to make things happen. So you're, you had asked about Dig This Design, so we're gonna kind of talk about it. It's an amazing little piece of real estate up in the universe. How cool is that, right? And especially for an old dog like me, it's like, what? How crazy is that? It's a billboard in the sky, which is what Dig This Design has become. It's a media platform. It's not necessarily, again, my name's not up there, even though, yes, I'm attached to that blog. You know, out of all the three internet companies, there was my company, didn't even knew it. I, all, I always knew that the internet companies were stepping stones taking me somewhere that the universe wanted me to go and I had to believe in that. It wasn't what, you know, and I, I didn't think it would be my end all, but I never imagined that Dig This Design would be that company and it's multiple streams of revenue. So think about that. So we do product reviews. So let's say um, um, American Standard will send me a beautiful faucet or something. And they say, well, you know, we want you to try this. And then we want you to review it and talk about it with me. So I do that. 
Those are written by me. I do it for ratio sprinkler system. It's not just the NKBA or KBiz or brands like that. I review fashion, I review beauty products. Another thing that I did, because I was so scared about being put in a box again, that Dig This Design is not a design blog, it's a lifestyle blog with many topics, right? I gave myself an opportunity to do this with it instead of doing this, right? And I'm not saying I'm right over everybody else that has a design blog, I'm not. It's just I wanted to make sure I didn't put myself in a box and have a blog just to promote me. My website promotes me, Patricia Davis Brown Designs. This is a completely separate entity. It is a lifestyle blog with many topics from architecture, DIY, art, fashion, technology, all the things that I dig. And, and that's how I promote it, is the things that I did. So Patricia, what would you say at this point in your business model is uh, your revenue stream percentage of you still doing design okay. versus the percentage of this revenue stream that I'm sure just comes in on a weekly basis? Yes. Well, this is passive income, meaning I could be on a boat, I could be in my pajamas anywhere making money. I get up in the morning. Well, also, let me finish telling you how I make money on here, right? So we have affiliate marketing. That's Google AdSense. Right? So you all search, uh, you know, KitchenAid Mixer. You come to my site, there's going to be an ad for KitchenAid Mixer, right? Like a billboard, right? So every month, Google AdSense sends me money. The better my analytics, the more money I'm going to make because more people are going to be coming to me, right? So I have to always be looking at my analytics to see how I'm doing year after year after year to make sure that people are still going to come to me. Banner ads, there are stagnant banner ads that people can actually have a billboard that stays on my site, um, which, you know, they'd have to pay a yearly rate for that. And it is an international blog. So percentage, it's, it, 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 you know, every year that's kind of a hard question because every year, depending on our world, what is our design business doing? But I'm diversified, right? So if it's not doing anything, the blog still is. The better question is, is how quickly the blog, if you looked on a chart, goes up in revenue, it's like this. So talk about, I am still fascinated by that blog, right? Because I outsource everything. My editor, my IT guy, I never have to look at them or talk to them, right? You guys are looking at each other now because I know I have you doing that. Um, you know, if the editor, something happens to her, I got them, right? The Gen Zers. But basically, you know, I get up in the morning and my first part of the morning is a cup of coffee in my pajamas looking at my opportunities for the day. Everybody trying to negotiate getting on my blog and I'm firm on my numbers. They'll negotiate. I'm like, no, no, no. You got to pay me this. You got to pay me this. You got to pay me this. And it's a constant. Right? So that's the first part of my day. I'm so happy in the morning. My blog makes me so happy. It's passive income, right? Then we get to the hard stuff, right? Design, <laughs> clients, builders. Okay, so multiple income streams. Now, the pandemic hit. They closed everybody down for a month. But you know what? Dig This Design didn't close down. Dig This Design kept bringing in revenue. As a matter of fact, it pumped it up. So, but every time you've got a change in our world, that's when we learn the most, right? That's where we learn to dance, learn to shift, learn to move. We watch businesses that were able to make the shift quickly, such as restaurants. I mean, they were hit hard. The ones that survived are the ones that adapted to the online delivery services and outdoor dining. What makes a survivor is the ability to change and adapt to the new world, to diversify your offerings. Everybody needs to, I don't care what the industry is, you need to not have all your eggs in one basket to be sustainable. And that's really what this talk is about. You don't necessarily have to, like I said, do the path that I did but you need, to, you need to think about how can I make the most offerings of what I know, and if I don't know it, we need, to, we need to learn some things. So what are my revenue streams? I do residential and commercial design because I can. I'm NCIDQ. 
concept development. I can work on any team of a commercial project because of my interior designer license or any, you know, uh, any project. Model home design, another great thing that happened because of my internet presence. You all have heard of Carl Icahn, the billionaire. He purchased a luxury home development in Vera Beach, Florida called uh, Grand Harbor. And the new president that moved in to take this over didn't know anybody, so he went to the internet because he, they had a selections person, not a designer, not a decorator, a selections person, and he wanted a designer. So he Googled design firms. Who came up first? I did, right? Because I've developed a presence out there. So he interviewed three of us. I got the job. All of a sudden, I'm working with a luxury home developer with a stream of homes coming in, doing model homes now. And it, it was quite a trip, you know? So we did that till they sold out all of that. Uh, space planning, I do full remodels, lighting, layouts, we've talked about that design, of course, custom furniture and cabinetry, furniture layouts, you know, sometimes people will buy a new property and they just, they, they leave all, they sell all their old stuff, They're in, they want a coastal, you know, home, and, and anyways, we, we can, because I do AutoCAD, we can do all, all the uh, layouts of that and then go and shop it. Full kitchen and bath remodel, models, color selections, business consultation, so businesses just like um, Schneider Electric um, can consult with me. People that are opening a, a, a cabinetry dealership can consult with me. Um, so accessory art, furnish acquisitions, of course, design consultation, design plans and construction documents, again, because AutoCAD, I can, we, we, we do develop all that. And the floor plans, you know, documents that go with it, detailed elevations, um, we do ceiling designs. We, we do the whole house on the interior architecture. Um, influencing an influencer, marketer, uh, product reviews as well on Dignus Design, paid advertisement across digital channels, brand ambassadorships, and speaking engagement and panels. How was I able to create revenue streams? First, knowledge. I have to build the knowledge. I call that sweat equity. Becoming a professional, I, I absolutely think that matters. Photographing my work so I can talk about it. And I evolved with the changing world. I didn't get scared. Everybody was scared, but I, I kept moving and I kept learning. With each change, I learned more. That a challenge will teach you the most. So that's it. Go out and be fearless, guys. Questions? Thank you.